Welcome inside the RX Muscle Studios in Westbury, New York for another episode of Iron Debate brought to you by Species Nutrition and Quest Nutrition. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. Glad you can join us on this Thursday night. Five topics. This is going to be the nutrition science episode of Iron Debate. We are joined by really one of the more foremost authorities in the industry when it comes to nutrition science. We're going to talk about the situation with the Sandow appearing on eBay. Is it a sign of disrespect or is it a sign of despair? Let's bring in our guest. Let's introduce live from California, again, one of the true geniuses of nutrition science. We welcome in Jerry Brainham. Jenny, Jerry, how are you doing tonight? How you doing, Sid? Okay, great. Excellent having you on the show. Let's bring in from Maine, the man they call the technician, Chris Aceto. Chris, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, Sid. And uh, before we get started, I wanted to put in a plug for uh, the person I'm debating. I usually like to throw the person I'm debating under the rug or under the bus. But, you know, Dave probably can agree that Jerry Branham and Mauro Di Pasquale, th those are the two writers or two scientists or two gurus that I've that I've always enjoyed reading and thought that, okay, not only does this make sense, but they actually believe and know what they're talking about. I mean, there's a lot of people who write stuff these days, and it's like, it's just rambling in circles. And and Jerry's been writing for, you know, since before his hair turned gray, right? <laughs> True. I mean, years and years and years. Yeah. And, you know, his stuff is always fresh and makes sense. I appreciate that, Chris. Thanks. Well, joining me in studio, as always, the boss, Dave Palumbo. Dave, this is a topic you've been waiting for for a long time to discuss nutrition science. Finally, we get one of the foremost authorities in Jerry Brainham on the show. Well, you know, I love the science and the nutrition aspect of, uh, the, sh of the sport in general. And Jerry and I are one of the few people, or Jerry's one of the few people that I could sit down with and actually have a discussion and have him know exactly what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's definitely refreshing, to say the least. And I think people will like this because people tend to, I find that what people want in this industry is is knowledge. And I think that's what they're going to get on this, this episode. Um, I also know that the technician, Chris Aceto, is very strategically... Um, wise. He softened Jeff, uh, Jerry up just enough so that he might have taken the edge off Jerry's you know, sharp tongue now. And now he will go in for the kill. I know it. So uh, I have a feeling this is going to be a good episode. Again, five topics, no agreement, all debate. If you want to join in the conversation, you can tweet your questions using hashtag RxDebate or you can join in on the active thread on the Muscle Central Forum on rxmuscle.com. If you're not already a member, it is free to register. Our first topic, when you win Bodybuilding's ultimate prize at the Olympia, you win the coveted Sandow Trophy. It is a trophy that has stood the test of time. It is a trophy that it symbolizes all the hard work, dedication, years of sacrifice that it takes to get on an Olympia stage and to be crowned the very best. Well, recently on ebay.com, there was a Sandow trophy. Now, at first, people wondered whether or not this was authentic, whether it was real. It was authenticated as a real Sandow trophy being sold on eBay.com. Now, as of yesterday, it was sitting at $10,000. Uh, Johnny, let's go to our producer, Johnny Salas. Johnny, what was it at recently? That was pretty much it. I got to look at it pretty much. Okay, so Johnny's going to be looking it up. But either way, that it was also confirmed that it was sold today for roughly about ten thousand dollars. So here's the question, and Jerry, we're going to start with you on this one. That is the pinnacle of bodybuilding success, the Sandow Trophy. Now there are a couple of different reasons that we could think of off the top of our heads as far as why a Sandow will be listed on eBay. One, just a sign of disrespect to everything that bodybuilding and the bodybuilding industry and the Olympia stand for, or two, even more darker, despair that an athlete, another sign of an athlete who's made a lot of money and now needs to sell possessions, valuable possessions, to make some money back. Where do you stand on this? Okay, first of all, I, I you know, it, it's very hard to figure out the motives of, of uh, somebody who's doing this, but I will say this, uh, my personal feeling is that 
whoever this is, I don't know which Mr. Olympia it is, but uh, whoever it is, he earned the trophy. And I, I feel, my personal feeling is he has the right to do whatever he wants with it. Now, let's compare this to like an Academy Award. And the, if you win an Academy Awards, uh, since 1950, the, uh, the Motion Picture Academy has made everyone who wins an Academy Award has to sign a statement that if they want to sell the Academy Award, they have to first contact the Academy, and, and the Academy will offer exactly $1 to buy back the Academy Award. But the point is that, you know, they're trying to discourage because they don't want it to be wind up in some, you know, schlock shop or one of those, you know, the, one of those, the places where you buy used goods or, or God knows, a warehouse sale. So, you know, they, they're trying to keep some aura of respect. That's their attempt to do so. But the bottom line is if you win an award, uh, you know, you, 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 you have the right to do whatever you want with it. And second, I should point point out again related to the academy award i mean if you check and uh, and see what a lot of these winners did do it's not that they gave away the award they used it for stuff like they uh, one guy i think marlon brando he made a lamp out of it uh, other guys uh, uh, one guy was using it as a doorstop so i mean i think they kind of i mean they, these actors have said this publicly so i mean to them it's it's no big deal i mean it, it depends on how you look at it but again to re reiterate my feeling is that if you win an award, it's yours. And, you know, if you want to, like, break in half and throw it in the garbage, that's your option. I don't think it's any measure of disrespect to, uh, to uh, 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 let's say, uh, the IFBB or any bodybuilding organization. And that's my personal feeling about it. It's got confirmation that the Sandow did sell for exactly, get this, $9,999. Chris, what about you? Um. I if 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 I knew it was authentic, I would have bought it. Um, I probably would have sold it to William Bonac. So in case he ever gets in another fight with Dexter Jackson and Dexter screams at him, he says, "Do you have a Sandow on your mantle?" Uh, Dexter will say, "Yeah, it's mine." Uh, you know, it's you know when I when I saw that it was for sale, I Dave, I actually wanted to contact you to find out because. I think it was they gave it away for ten grand uh, because you could resell it. Just uh, before we get into my position, you could resell it for a lot more because well, what do the VIP tickets go for at the Olympia? Ten thousand. No. Seven hundred. <laughs> What's a VIP ticket for the Olympia? Grand. Seven. Yeah, maybe. Okay, Seven. grand. You have to fly yourself out there. Whoever's buying the, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who will pay far more. I think for a Sandow Trophy, who are big bodybuilding buffs, fans, uh, would pay more than 10 grand. I'm surprised not. Did Norman, Norman buy it? I'm surprised <laughs> one did buy it. Oh. It's probably a tax deduction based on, you know, he, he, he's an accountant. He could figure out how to deduct it and probably depreciate it somehow. But, you know, when I was looking at the, the Sandow, what struck me is that it's a, it's a piece of art. And, you know... Jerry can tell you from being up at Weider's office, Weider was an art buff, right? He had all those Remingtons everywhere. So they didn't give this, this uh, you know, 10-foot high uh, bodybuilding trophy that you used to win back in the days, like in Long Island, you know, bodybuilding shows. They gave a, a, a piece of artwork that would endure for years. Um, my, expect, my, my, my thought is someone like Joe Weider, who created the Olympian, created the trophy would probably, if he was alive, uh, pay the Olympia winner or, it, you know, do something so that it's not just sold out on like a commodity out on the open market. I personally, if uh, I was surprised it was for sale and I know uh, I, I understand where Jerry's coming from that, you know, the guy earned it and it's uh, sellable. But if you're Mr. Olympia, I, I would think you can generate 10 grand somewhere else other than selling the, you know, something that represents not only the title, but has history, you know, because Arnold has a, Arnold must have a Sandow, right? Samir has a Sandow, unless, unless these guys sold it. Samir, I mean, the, the greats, Jay, Coleman, Heath, Dorian, they all have the Sandow, or a Sandow. You know, it's not like there's a hundred floating around out there. You know, $10,000 seems like a giveaway. Dave, let's get you in on this on the final word. So Jerry doesn't feel that it's uh, an affront to the Olympia. 
to the competitors or to the IFBB. Chris, um, kind of has a different stance on it. Where do you stand on this with somebody selling their Sandow on eBay and it's selling for $9,999? I think it's a mistake to sell it. The guy, yeah, you know, it's, you can sell anything you want. I, just, I think it's a terrible mistake to sell it. Um, I have a watch somebody gave me years ago. It was valued at five grand. I've never taken it out of the box. I wanted to sell it once. When I got desperate, it's worth twenty two grand now. So <laughs> Dave, let's get you on this for the final word on where you stand on the Sandow being sold on eBay and being sold for nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine. Well, you know, like Jerry said, you know, you can do whatever you want with what you got. I mean, I threw out a lot of my bodybuilding trophies. Granted, I didn't win the Sandow, you know, and I probably wouldn't have thrown that out. Um I probably would have sold it to Steve Blackman for a hell of a lot more than that. But, uh, <laughs> Maybe Steve bought it. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. That's a, that's a, you know, a lease buys you know stuff that's way more than that. I, I if I was Steve, I would have bought the the sand out. Absolutely, put frame it, put it in like some kind of, uh, you know, I wouldn't have minded getting. I, you know, I would have been too jealous. I wouldn't have want to buy a sand. I would have wanted to earn one, and since I didn't, I would be like, well, I don't want it then, you know. But uh, the the real question is and. Who sold it? That's what's the most interesting to me. I wonder, you, you know, if Arnold sold it, you know, it would be go, it would go for a million. So you know, all, we could definitely rule Arnold out. And Lee Haney has too much integrity to sell his. Uh, I don't think Dorian would sell his either. Um, he might lease his out, but uh, uh, you know that. And, and Franco Colombo doesn't probably need the money. And Larry now Larry Scott's dead, so you know maybe his family sold one of his sandals. He's got two. Good point. Good point. Uh, I don't think Samir. I think that's Samir's whole identity. I don't think Samir would sell his sandal. <laughs> and, and Chris Dickerson, sure same thing. It. You know. Any guesses, Chris, Jerry? Uh, I think you know, I want to make my guess first. My right. guess is that um, Ronnie Coleman sold one of them. He figures, ah, I got eight. What the hell? I'll get rid of one. And, and he probably gave the money to some like homeless person who needed some cash. And uh, that, that's, my, that's my belief. Jerry? I would tend to agree with Dave. But I think it, whoever sold it, and the reasoning was sound as far as the other guys about Lee Haney having a lot of integrity. And Arnold, if Arnold sold it, it would, <laughs> Arnold doesn't go cheap. It would have to be at least a million. I agree with that, too. Uh, I would say the most likely suspect is Ronnie Coleman. He won eight of them. And what the hell is one? You know, he still has seven left. You know, whatever his reasoning was to sell one, he doesn't need him. He's still got seven. I mean, you're not going to see a guy like, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy you just mentioned, Chris, who got in a fight, uh, who won the one Sandow, uh, like uh, Chris Dickerson or, or those guys who won. Dexter. I don't think those guys would sell it. No, but I also would add that I don't know if uh, you guys will have to correct me on this. Larry Scott, when he won it, uh, he won the first two Olympias in 65 and 66, and I, I was at one of them. He didn't get a sand though. He got this cheap, crappy crown that they put on his head, <laughs> and he always left. It didn't fit on his head right if you look at the photos. Now, I don't know whether they gave him the Sandow statues later. That's what I'm blank on. But I don't know if Larry Scott even got Sandow, but I don't think Scott would sell him. He also doesn't impress me. So, again, I'd have to agree with Dave and go with Ronnie Coleman as the most likely suspect. Chris? I think Frank Zane. He didn't, you oh, know, I didn't yeah, well, he's, you're right. he's, he's got three. You're right. He does He cares about self-empowerment and, and, uh, and, uh, and bettering himself spiritually and mentally. So what's a token trophy on his mantle at 70 years old mean to him? Hmm. All right. We are going to move on now to our next topic. Now, on this show, we've dabbled around a social media and how it's kind of shaped the perception of the sports for the perception of the athletes. And now we're going to talk about the perception of the gurus, of the nutrition coaches. One of the things that has really become more prominent lately are the nutritional tips, tips of the week. And, well, Dave and I were talking in the office yesterday, and we talked about how some of them tend to be, some of them are accurate, some of them are repetitive, some of them are just downright inaccurate, but then they get goofy. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Some of these self-proclaimed gurus in the nutritional world and their take on, or at least their distribution on social media with trying to get their names out there, and doing so in a manner which right now is becoming more and more creative and at times it could come off as silly. So Chris, we're going to start with you on this one because you are more of the old school technique. You're not really that high on really where social media has taken the sport. What are your thoughts 
on gurus taking to social media with their nutritional tip of the week, tip of the day, or whatever it is, and how they're presenting it. Anyone really gives a crap about a tip of the week. I think the people giving the tip of the week think that people care about a tip of the week. But I think it's nonsensical, and nobody cares, and nobody applies it, and they're just like... It's like saying, you know, the sky is blue today. No shit in L.A. It's blue most of the day. You know, I mean, I don't think people really care. And, and I think Dave's alluding to one of the gurus' tip of the week, uh, Jerry, this week, was uh, if you burn 500, uh, if you reduce your calories by 500 a day in seven days, you reduce by 3,500 calories and you, should, and you will lose two pounds of fat. <laughs> Jerry doesn't even know where to start on that, yeah. right? That's old. Yeah, that's a first of all, he's wrong. No, you missed it. Two, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's what? It well, for one, one thing, pound. it's actually it's actually four thousand two hundred calories in a pound of fat. It's not thirty five hundred. It, it's an old figure that's actually wrong. Somebody did a dissertation recently, and they calculated that it's actually four thousand two hundred. But I don't. I wouldn't expect a lot of people to know that. In fact, I just found that out myself. But you know that 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 that's like a really old uh, uh, that goes down, Jerry. Not one, two. Oh well, it's first of all, it's, it's <laughs> one. Uh, uh, it's one pound of fat, if I remember correctly, isn't it? Five hundred. It is. It, yeah, it was mean, wrong. Uh, so so uh, he's right. He, right away, he didn't double check, and you know this is a. Uh, I don't want to interrupt Chris. I mean, he was in the middle of. But I'll add more. Go ahead and finish your your statement. Chris. No, I just my my whole point on it is nobody really cares cares about a tip of the week. I, you know, I don't think really people care to be, see, you know, listen, people don't care to see, uh, you know, Sean Roden's chicken breast from this morning. They really don't. And, you know, you can have this whole idea of like, I have 100,000 followers. It, it really, to me, what's it really mean? Because those same 100 Bodybuilding aficionados, quote, aficionados. They're following Coleman. They're following Jay. They're following Heath. They're following uh, Dennis Wolf, Sean Roden, Kai Green. You know, what, what is it a measurement of? It's just an oddity that, uh, you know, I, I find it odd and I find it even more odd that people feel compelled to take pictures every single day of their food or put out a tip of the week. Well, Jerry, I mean, what is the tip of the week? What's it? It's 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 who came up with it, and what's the benefit of it? Jerry, let's go to your your thought. Who? Jerry, you? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, well, you know, I I would kind of I, first of all, I agree. Uh, you know, I, I I can't disagree with Chris. I know you want me to, but I can't because he's right about. We just want your strongest week. opinions. That's it. <laughs> okay, all right. Let me let me put it to you this way. Uh, I have really mixed feelings about the internet in general. I've said this several times. I mean, it's grown over the years. It's become like a primary source of information. And there's a lot of great things about the internet. I mean, you, you can, there's information at the tip of your fingers. You can go to various sites. But the, the really bad part, the part that annoys me related to what we're talking about, is that anybody on the internet becomes an instant expert. You can anoint yourself a guru, a trainer. I mean, it, it's it's absolutely <laughs> absurd. Anyone? I mean, the, the YouTube videos are ridiculous. I mean, I don't want to mention any names. There's a guy who has a tremendous amount of followers, I and mean, you guys will probably guess who he is. He's got these huge arms that are suspect with synthol. You know, what, what is? Who's that? Oh, that yeah, leg sweep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> synthol, uh, you know, based arms, and, and you know, this guy tells people to do like, you know, you know 300 reps every night uh, for your arms before you go to sleep using 15 pound dumbbells and this kind of stuff. And, you know, I mean, it's just nonsensical. I mean, I would say that, that uh, you really, you have to have a little bit of prior knowledge to know, to separate truth from fiction because there's so much information thrown at you. Uh, and, and like I say, my feeling from what I've seen is I, I'm just absolutely disgusted about some of the things I see on websites and blogs. In fact, that was a major motivation for me to resurrect this newsletter I have. It's called Applied Metabolics. I had it back in the 90s. It was published by Iron Man, but I, I resurrected it about nine, ten months ago because I was just encountering one garbage site after another. And these blogs, there were just tons of misinformation. These people don't bother to double-check their facts. 
I said, you know what, I got to offer some really good, solid science, evidence-based information and couple that with my, you know, five decades of experience. And that's what my newsletter is, basically. So, you know, that's my feeling is that, you know, you, you, get, you just have to be careful who you listen to. Uh, like I say, uh, anyone could be an expert on the Internet. And it wasn't like that years ago. Dave, let me get you in on this because you are uh, social media savvy and you, you do believe it in, in social media to a certain extent. But, but here's my question to you in particular. With these gurus coming out with their weekly tips or just really trying to feature themselves and feature their own expertise, do they need it? And who exactly are they trying to reach? And, and, and don't they take the risk of exposing themselves if they come out with something that's just either outlandish or silly? Well, the old uh, lawyer saying, don't ask a question you know the, you don't know the answer to. Uh, here's my feeling on the whole kit and caboodle. First of all, you can't give a nutrition tip of the week. It's, it's ridiculous, okay? The fact that they're making mistakes and putting out ridiculous you know, uh, tips of the week is even more foolhardy. But the bottom line is, what they're really saying is, I'm too fucking lazy to put out an article of the week. That's what people should be doing. You don't put a tip of the week, nutrition ticket. You put a quote of the week. Quote of the week is different because you can take this one quote and elaborate on it and you can apply it to your life. A tip of the week is, is just trivial knowledge. If you want to impress the masses out there, put out an article of the week like Jerry does. Or like, you know, and I, I wish I could put out an article a week. I just don't have enough time to write one. That's why I don't put out a tip of the week. Every once in a while, I'll put out an article that I feel is a, a topic that people really want to tackle. And, well, I guess I do do an article of the week because we do the Ask Dave TV show every week. And I answer questions, you know, for 45 minutes. So, I mean... A tip of the week is, is, is so trivial. It doesn't really paint a picture of anything that's you know valuable or valid in the way of uh, nutritional advice. And I think that's what Chris is really getting at. Chris is just annoyed by the fact that it's not serving any purpose other than to promote yourself or promote these gurus. And you know, once again, you know, I understand the whole social media wow factor, and people uh, of this generation are so instantaneous. They don't have the, the patience to sit and read or, or watch a long video. They want something in 10 seconds to give them advice. For, unfortunately, I don't think they're providing any benefit other than the marketing of the particular person putting it out. But, but again, it goes back to my question. Who are they reaching out to? Right? Where you have, you have a lot of coaches now on Instagram who see you know, a competitor on Instagram and they're sending them a direct message. Hey, I'll do your diet. Right? Right. But that's obviously one tier of uh, a fitness competitor, somebody, somebody who's relatively new, who are these people trying to reach? Are they trying to actually reach the seasoned IFBB competitor? Are they trying to reach a lower tier? They're trying to stay relevant is what they're trying to do. They're trying exactly. to stay relevant in the social media world because in the social media world, on the internet, and you're irrelevant in a month if you don't do something. Luckily for Chris and I, we have a radio show every week and we do these TV shows, so we're always relevant. So a lot of these guys are not really seen, so they want to make themselves relevant and they're too lazy to write an article. Maybe they're not even capable of writing an article, I don't know. And so they put up a tip of the week so people see their face and their picture. And I understand it. It's a, mar it's a mo marketing tool. I just don't think it serves and sometimes it, it's laughable because you only have so many tips of the week and after a while you start putting up, you know, silly stuff. And that's, I think, what's, what, you know, what we start <laughs> laughing at when we see these things. Let's go on to our next topic now. Now we talk about actual nutrition science. So we're going to talk about the best diet, macronutrient-wise, to lose weight. Now, many times uh, an IPB pro competitor, one of the high-tier ones, are going to post their diets. They're going to talk about their high-carb diets. Now, here's the question. Are their diets misleading to amateurs, to the general public, given the fact that a, a high-end IABB pro or high-end fitness competitor is going to be of a different genetic background than somebody who is not really going to ever aspire to get to that level. So, Chris, let's start with you. Uh, the first part of the question, your best diet macronutrient-wise to lose body fat? Well, first, uh, Sid, I just got to comment on the uncanny – uh, similarity between mine, my shirt, and Jerry's. <laughs> yeah, wow. You just got a, a, a different color. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> He's a technician, too. He's also, where the hell are my reading glasses? He's got the same glasses as me, too, but I, I'm just not reading, so I I didn't even. That's <laughs> <laughs> the twins. That's what I you're look like in, in 30 years. Well, Unbelievable. Hey, welcome to twins, too. <laughs> but. 
<laughs> Listen, the, 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 the best diet is always going to be some form or variable of a low-carb diet, pure and simple. Because what I've found is, and I always try to find, is at what level of carbohydrate intake can somebody lose weight? I think it, as like a thermostat set on your house, it's like people set the thermostat at 70. Uh, and if you go below 70, you know, uh, some people get cold. If you, if you, for some people it might be, you know, 73. So for some people it could be 67. So I try, try to find some type of number, numeric number, where I can peg someone's carbohydrates and then from there lower them and realize that's their sort of threshold point where they can get leaner. Um, and and I, I, I've been doing diets for, you know, a long time and I've never been able to work with uh, anyone who's been able to get really lean on a high carbohydrate diet unless they're like 20 years old they're 20 year old bodybuilder and the metabolism is just freaky i mean there there's definitely exceptions to the rule um i think in his early career jay cutler ate a fabulous amount of carbohydrates and was able to get lean and for some reason that allowed him to stay really really round and full uh but uh, everyone else I work with, people say, oh, Eduardo Correa, he must have a heart. No, he eats a low-carb diet, um, you know, rodent, blah, blah, blah. Everyone seems to respond to a low-carb diet. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it always surprises me when someone says, oh, it was cut on, you know, I was eating 400. You know, immediately what pops into my mind is chemistry after that. You know, <laughs> what were you using that allowed you to get cut on 500 grams of carbohydrates a day? Jerry, let's get you in on this. Well, I also have to go along with the low-carbohydrate diet. I mean, uh, as Chris pointed out, there are exceptions to the rule. And I think somebody wrote, I can't remember who it was, but somebody wrote, somebody estimated that about 75% about of the population tends to be on the insulin insensitive side. And these people have to be, if they don't really kind of watch their carbs or restrict their carbs, it's very difficult for them to lose body fat. Now, that other 25% that are not insulin insensitive, uh, they could have, a, uh, like Chris was saying, there are some people, these guys can have a lot of carbohydrates and still lose a, a, a tremendous amount of body fat depending on how many total calories they're taking in in relation to their physical activity. So, and as far as the, uh, the bodybuilders uh, telling people about uh, their high carb diets, again, you have to look at the chemical equation. I mean, if they, if, assuming these guys are telling the truth, they could be using drugs that make carbohydrates irrelevant. I mean, they could be using, for example, higher amounts of thyroid. Uh, they could possibly be using some clenbuterol for a while. They could, uh, some of the more daring ones might even be, even be using DNP, which I consider absolute uh, horror, horrible stuff. I mean, but I mean, you could basically eat anything on DNP and you're still going to lose body fat. So, you know, you have to look at the big picture, but generally speaking, I think without question for the vast majority of uh, bodybuilders or, or people on the street, uh, again, the low carbohydrate diet is best because at least two of its features, for example, the, the low carbohydrate diet is almost always accompanied by a higher protein intake and studies have shown that protein actually imparts a safety value. In other words, it, it helps to get you to control your appetite, so it makes it easy to stay on a diet. And in recent studies where they've compared head-to-head -head low carb diets, and this was not bodybuilders, this was just average people, where they compared low carb diets to let's say low fat, high carb diets, and just regular so-called balanced diets, the low carb diets always showed the greatest amount of fat loss. And some critics point out that well, in the uh, you know after a year, the, the fat loss is the same on all the diets. But the point is that you know if you check and, and, and see, you find that a lot of these people by the end of the year have gradually added carbohydrates back. So I mean, they're taking in like 150, 200 grams of carbohydrate. They're no longer on low carb diets by the end of the year. So you know, there's no question in my mind. I mean, speaking personally, I've said this many, many times. When I competed in bodybuilding years ago, I always was on I was on a ketogenic diet, not just a low carb. I was on almost zero carbs. I never ate more than let's say 
40 grams of carbs a day. And I found from experience that's the only diet that ever was able to get fat off my body. I'm not a naturally muscular guy, but it worked every time, every time. Every other diet, low fat, high carb, they utterly failed. I couldn't stay on them. I was voraciously hungry. So again, I, I'd say the low carbohydrate without question is the best diet. Chris, let's get you in on uh, the second part of this question. And that is <laughs> when athletes talk about their, their high carb intake, uh, is that sending a misleading message uh, to the rest of the, you know, again, to their fans, to aspiring bodybuilders, aspiring fitness competitors who may not have those kind of genetics or that kind of makeup uh, to, to still look the way that they look despite their high carb intake? It's all misleading, meaning the, the workouts are misleading. I mean, I, you know, I, I saw a video the other day of a great bodybuilder. I don't know if it was just like for a, a, a training video for to, let's make a video and we'll throw it on a website, but there was no there was no free weights involved. And me and Dave have harped on this forever. There was no training to failure involved. There was no explosive mo movements involved. It was just pumping action, and you cannot build muscle pumping muscles. You can you if you're genetically you have fabulous genetics. You can probably build some muscle pumping up, but uh, you know I think I think it, the, the nutrition part can be misleading for the average Joe, and the idea that you the the training portion is is misleading so um it's stunning to me because w when 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 i came up um you know i i i read everything i could on nutrition and, and and took what i read and tried to put it to use and you know with with we we talked me and dave on the on the radio show the other night about training and dave said he'd have anxiety attacks almost going to the gym thinking, holy shit, I have to get under five plates on legs, you know, to, to get my legs to grow, to do squats. I see people these days who are Olympia folks doing three-quarter leg press, leg press. You know, um, I can't deny that they're on the Olympia stage. I can't deny that they carry a lot of muscle, but I don't think it's the most effective or efficient way to build muscle so therefore it can be misleading same thing with you know if you were going to trying to copy a diet or, or build off a base that somebody might be saying you know meal one two cups of oatmeal and 12 egg whites meal two three cups of rice and eight ounces of ch chicken I mean most people if not close to all people uh, aren't going to be able to lose body fat or, or even build the right type of physique on that type of a diet Jerry, uh, what, what, what's the what do you want me well, to say? No, what's the, the question is, uh, you know, given that you know magazine articles and now obviously with social media, a lot of these athletes will post their diets, and many of them will post you know high carb intake, um, and we're wondering if that's misleading uh, to their fans, to the amateurs who are not going to have that same genetic makeup or the same overall profile uh, as these seasoned IFBB pros. Well, it depends on whether the guy's telling the truth or not. I mean, like I said, there's a smaller percentage of people that can handle really large amounts of carbohydrates. I, I've, I remember when I interviewed bodybuilders years ago, I interviewed a lot of them when I wrote for Weeder for uh, over a decade. Uh, I, 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 I would ask them about their diets, all of them, and I, I, I'd say about maybe 20% of them told me that they were on higher carb diets. Uh, and I asked them why, and they told me that if they cut their carbs too low, they lose a lot of muscle. Regardless of, of what you know, what kind of drugs they're using, it makes no difference. They felt that they would lose muscle size, so they might. I don't know. It's a it's a question of of, of misleading anyone. It it could be that their genetics allow them to eat you know higher amounts of carbohydrates. I don't. They might not necessarily be lying or or even misleading. But I I'd also add that for the majority of people, I still believe that a low carbohydrate diet is is probably the the way to go. And also, I want to comment on uh, what Chris said about the uh, the workout routines. I also encountered a video 
Uh, in fact, it was just the other night, I, I was just fooling around on YouTube, and I encountered a video made by Phil Heath, who is, of course, the current Mr. Olympia. That's and the one I was thinking about. <laughs> well, I, 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 Who gets the same was, shirt and watch the same videos, Jerry? It probably was. It probably was, you know. This guy was, uh, it was a recent video, and it was showing him training his shoulders, and he went to the gym, and, and sure enough, just like Chris, uh, I think he, it was mostly machines that he used, but the thing that I noticed was that his movements, his actual form was awful. It was all short, little, tiny movements. I mean, uh, he did most of his exercises wrong. He did this thing where, you know, the old bent over laterals where you're kind of like sitting down. He, he was doing them like, like this. I mean, he wasn't even contracting his rear delt. And I said to myself, now, some kid or somebody who aspires to be a, a top bodybuilder is going to look at Heath and, and maybe try and duplicate that workout. And they're going to wind up like getting nothing because they're not really fully working the muscle. And it's nothing to do with steroids or any drugs that Heath is using. It's the fact that as Heath himself calls himself, I think his, uh, what is his, his little uh, moniker is uh, the gift. In other words, he's like, a gene he started out as a basketball player. Yep. And like in three years, he's Mr. Olympia, something like that. This guy, this guy's the kind of guy where if he lifts up a glass of water, he's going to get an, uh, you know, an inch on his arm. You know, so you can't, you know, you, my, my message is these guys have to be careful when you're looking at these these top of their videos. I mean, don't try to duplicate what they do because it just, you know, j yes, they are successful. The guy's Mr. Olympia, but it doesn't mean that what he does is going to work for most people. In most cases, in my opinion, it will not work for nine out of ten bodybuilders that try his type of training because it, it just it's just not right. Basically, it's not it, he, he doesn't they don't have the genetics. They don't, they're not going to respond like he do to these little short baby movements that he's doing. It's not going to work. You got to do a full muscle contraction most of the time. Dave, let's get you in on this. The first part, your best diet macronutrient-wise to lose body fat. Well, I think everyone knows my diet approach. I mean, they call it the Palumbo ketogenic diet. So <clears throat> I am obviously not an advocator of carbs to lose weight. Now, having said that, I do have competitors that I diet down that do eat carbs because some people have very good metabolisms. But the, the, the bottom line is that protein and fats build and repair muscle. And you have to have that as your core of your, of your program. And really, fat, uh, carbs become the expendable nutrient because it's just a fuel source. So you got to figure out how much fuel the person needs uh, using the carbs, if they even need the carbs at all. And, and then you go with that. I mean, and, and the, the bottom line is that these guys saying they're eating five, 600 grams of carbs, I actually believe that a lot of these guys are. Unfortunately, it's not the whole diet. They might be doing a couple days a week. But e there are guys out there that can metabolize an enormous amount of calories. Uh, Juan Morel, who I used to work with, he, I mean, this guy, you, have to, you can't even give him clean carbs. you got to go send him to McDonald's and eat, have him eat French fries. So there are people with gifted metabolisms, but it does send a very skewed message to the masses. They think, oh, you need carbs. And then you get Blackman and you get George Farah, you know, saying, carbs, carbs, more carbs, you know. And yeah, carbs, carbs, because, you know, because Dave Palumbo <laughs> says the opposite. And, you know, it really sends a mixed message to people. And then I, I, I get guys, and I know Chris gets guys who came from that MD camp, and they're like, I couldn't get in shape. I was a fat piece of you-know-what on stage. What am I doing wrong? And then we see they're eating 500 grams of carbs, 400 grams of carbs, even 300 grams of carbs is a lot of carbs to diet on. And, uh, you know, remember, carbs cause insulin release. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. You want low insulin while you're dieting because that's going to make losing body fat easier. So obviously a, law, a lower carb approach is definitely uh, the best approach to lose weight for 98% of the population. And that's the right message to send. Now, that does like once again, there are different ways to skin the cat. You can, if you wanna bust your ass and do three hours of cardio a day, you could probably eat a lot of carbs, but you're just basically feeding the cardio at that point. Uh, the mixed message that, that bothers me is that young people are impressionable by the top stars in the sport and when those, those guys should say, when people ask them how much they eat, they should start by prefacing, hey, I'm a genetic freak. Don't listen to me. This works for me, but it probably won't work for everyone else. Uh, I think as the, as the top tier athletes in the sport, you have a, a, almost an onus to, uh, of responsibility to impart the right messages. Unfortunately, a lot of guys just don't know. You ask Ronnie Coleman what he ate when he competed, he'll tell you. He probably, you know, he probably ate no carbs, but then he ate, you know, 10 bottles of Masterpiece barbecue sauce <laughs> that had 
sugar in it. So he probably was eating 400 grams of carbs a day. He didn't even know it, though. So, you know, once again, as Jerry said, the Internet is a great thing because there's a lot of knowledge out there. But it's a terrible thing because you don't know what to believe and what not to. With that, we are going to step aside. But when we come back, we're going to talk about the three best performance enhancing drugs. The three science experts on the panel are going to talk about the three best PEDs for bodybuilders heading into a show. That and more. And if you want to get in with your questions, tweet using hashtag RxDebate or go to the Muscle Central Forum on RxMuscle.com and join in on the active thread. Iron Debate returns in two minutes. Yep. The decadent taste of salted caramel. A thick, creamy texture with a silky, smooth finish. The best tasting shake on earth. Yeah! A little help here, Jill. <laughs> uh, and a whopping 22 grams of protein in every scoop. Say hello to Salted Caramel, another delicious reason to love your protein powder. Visit QuestNutrition.com. I asked you before, Kim Williams, what species are you? I'm Seth Johns, I'm on the ASA national team, and I snowboard hard every day. For complete joint health, I take Arthralyze Elite. Species Nutrition, what species are you? Figure Pro Heather Dees, and you are watching RX Television. Mm. Welcome back, Iron Debate on RXMuscle.com. Reminder the show is going to be available in its full replay after the conclusion of the show on RXMuscle.com. You can check out the website, our YouTube channel, all our shows Iron Debate, Heavy Muscle TV, Fitness View, uh, Ask Dave. Our 45-minute question and answer with Dave Palumbo, all available on rxmuscle.com and our YouTube channel. We are joined tonight by Jerry Brainham. Let's move on with the show with our fourth topic, the three most effective performance-enhancing drugs that bodybuilders can use heading into a competition and why. Jerry, we go to you first. Well, I, I think it also, I think you'd have to kind of like divide that between amateur and pro. Uh, for pros, there's no question in my mind that uh, if you compare, the, let's say, the current physiques today to some of the guys, let's say, 20 years ago, I mean, I think the difference in size is largely attributed to, two, to three actual drugs, which is testosterone, 
uh, growth hormone, and insulin. So, you know, for in, in terms of producing massive muscle size, those three uh, have kind of a synergistic effect. And what's really interesting from a medical scientific perspective is the fact that testosterone alone, without question, imparts anabolic effects in muscle. But, you know, if you look at the, the literature about, uh, about both, uh, about both uh, uh, growth hormone and insulin, taken alone, they're not that anabolic. And, I mean, uh, growth hormone uh, is, is known to, like, kind of stimulate more connective tissue development than actual muscle protein synthesis. And if you look at insulin, insulin is a great anti-catabolic. In other words, it helps prevent muscle breakdown. But as far as an anabolic, when you take it alone, it, it's not as anabolic as people think. But something happens, and, you know, they're just starting to look at this, you know, the actual medical scientists, but it's been known in bodybuilding now for several years that when you combine, let's say, testosterone, growth hormone, and insulin, there's some sort of weird synergistic effect that – you know, it's it's like exponential. Instead of three and three equals six, it becomes three and three equals twelve when you take all three drugs. I mean, there's a couple of theories. For example, we all know how one of the main side effects of growth hormone is hyperglycemia. It tends to kind of make uh, your blood glucose elevate. Now, if you take insulin, one of insulin's primary function is to lower blood glucose. So, you know, you have a balancing effect when you take growth hormone with insulin. Now. For some strange reason, when you take insulin with growth hormone and, let's say, testosterone, the insulin now does become anabolic, which for, for some mysterious reason. And I just want to quickly add, insulin alone is anabolic only under one circumstance when it's in the presence of a large amount of amino acids. Then it be, actually becomes anabolic. But in normal circumstances, it's what they call a permissive anabolic. And in other words, it basically kind of allows an anabolic effect to, to occur in muscle. But it, one thing it does for sure is it definitely promotes an anti catabolic effect. So my theory is that you have a combination of, of testosterone, growth hormone, and insulin. You're having you're maximizing both the anabolic and the anti catabolic effect. And as a consequence, you're getting these like gigantic physiques. Now, I, I just want to add a kind of a little addendum to this statement is the fact that I also think that this particular trio of drugs is responsible for uh, a lot of the uh, problems that we have in bodybuilding today as far as, let's say, some of the uh, distended abdominal. That I, I can't really nail it. I don't have any evidence to show for sure that it's that particular trio. But I, 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 my, my feeling is that if you look back, this particular combination of drugs has been used for quite a few years now, and yet the preponderance of, let's say, the bloated abdomens, they all, they're, they're, you know, they, they started fairly recently. And my guess, and this is my theory, is that it's not so much those particular drugs, it's the dosages that are being used. Because I don't, again, I, I, I don't work with any of these guys. I'm only going by secondhand information. But the doses I've been hearing, some of the guys use, for example, just to pick one of the three, growth hormone, I've heard doses of uh, 36 and 40 units a day of growth hormone, which is just massive, massive amounts. And, and the, you know, the, 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 the what is it, 2,000 milligrams of testosterone. I mean, when you're taking these kind of dosages, strange things are going to happen to your body. So, you know, I would say if you're looking, if you're talking in terms of muscle size, that particular combination would be the uh, number one, if you want to call it PED for bodybuilders. Uh, and not necessarily for amateurs, they might want to use a couple, a little bit different combination because it might make them a little bit too bloated. They might not do it right. And so, but, but for the pro ranks, I'd say those three for sure. Chris, let's get you in on this. Your top three PEDs for bodybuilders. I'll stick with the, uh, with the pro ranks. Um, testosterone, because uh, without testosterone, you look like Bruce, Bruce Jenner looks like now. <laughs> wow. So, you know, I mean... <laughs> The common sense, you know, approach that I think of is, you know, you look at a teenager who's 15 years old, he goes through puberty, crazy testosterone levels, he starts training with weights and he just explodes with like crazy dense muscle in two years. So test, um, GH, because if it's not from China, then <laughs> it, uh, I don't like anything from China. I, I eat Maine apples, not the Chinese apples. Um I, I like real wood furniture, like my desk behind me, not a melamine 
pressed wood made from China, Chinese uh, sawdust. Um, real GH, what my experience is, exerts an amazing 3D roundness type uh, look to the muscle, um, even on bodybuilders who, in other words, you know, it seems like you can take a lot of tests and a lot of other things and have a nice round look and physique, but you can lower those amounts. And if you have access to pharmaceutical GH, you just get a much rounder look to the muscle. So test GH and thyroid. I think that, um, uh, I, I, I think that adding some type of thyroid to the mix seems to elevate the metabolism enough where the bodybuilder can at least keep some carbohydrates in the diet, which seems to exert a muscle sparing effect in the dieting phase. Where, whereas if the person didn't have T3 there, he'd have to ultimately most people would have to lower their carbs to such a degree where they're fighting, maintaining their muscle mass while dieting. So those three, test GH and T3. Dave, let's get you in on this. Your top three PEDs for pro bodybuilders going into a contest. Yeah, just to preface it, I think Jerry uh, just was picking the, the top three drugs to put size on. and that, so. But this we're talking about comp, going into competition. So uh, definitely testosterone. Testosterone is the number one drug because – that will give you the biggest gains of anything else. Now, you can go into the nuances of the different anabolic steroids, Trembolone and EQ, but testosterone is definite. I think growth hormone has made some traumatic changes when synergized with, with the testosterone, so I think that ad, that has to be number two, especially on a pre-contest diet because it definitely puts you in a more uh, a better fit, state of fat burning or fat mobilization. Um, I, I would almost go with Chris with, with T3 Cytomel, uh, thyroid hormone, but I, I, I'm going to go with clenbuterol. I think clenbuterol is a better fat burner. Like if I had to pick my big three, uh, testosterone, growth hormone, and clenbuterol, I think that would get you probably the most ripped, keeping you the biggest. Uh, I just feel that clenbuterol is, is, a, is a more effective fat burner while it doesn't ha have any effect on thyroid hormone, uh, although some people tend to see higher T3 levels in their bloodstream when they're on clenbuterol. Uh, and the two of those tend to synergize each other whether better, the clenbuterol and the T3. I, if I had to pick one, I would go with clenbuterol. As the, I think clenbuterol is the best fat burner uh, available, uh, pharmaceutically speaking. Uh, I think it yields the most fat loss, even more than growth hormone does and more than thyroid does. And it has a muscle sparing effect. So uh, that would be my three, testosterone, growth hormone, and uh, clenbuterol. You're watching Iron Debate on RxMuscle.com, brought to you by Species Nutrition and Quest Nutrition. Again, if you're not already a member of the Rx Muscle Muscle Central Forum, register now. You can join in. You can ask your questions. You can be part of all of our conversations. Uh, during the week, we have our show, Ask Dave, 30-minute, 45-minute uh, question and answer with Dave Palumbo. You can get your questions in that way as well. We go to our final question now. And this one has potential to get a little controversial. The best and worst magazine publisher over the years and why? Chris, we're going to start with you on this one. The best, no doubt about it, is Joe Ida because he was the first. And it's it's hard to be the first in anything. Um, and, of course, he was like nine years old uh, <laughs> or, or 16 when he started. But, you know, he was the best because he started – the uh, magazine, he may not have started, been the first, but he started it in a big way when uh, the idea of uh, grown men putting on colored underwear and oil under lights and posing for other men was thought of from a societal point of view as being gay and and, and just oddballish and, and everything else. So... And then he tried to, you know, he tried to legitimize it the best he could with bringing in science writers and, uh, you know, going from empirical evidence to scientific articles. And he had the best photographers. And, uh, you know, the, the, he had the, the whole ball of wax. So Joe for sure was 
and will always be number one because publishing is dead now. <laughs> um, and I will take a pot shot at MD in, in this sense. Um, as we know, uh, in its heyday was a great magazine, for sure. A um, lot of articles, a lot of science articles, a lot, lot of... Um, before ads just took over the industry, MD was a, a very good magazine, but they had they have had over the years uh, an identity crisis, right? They went from all natural to you know if, when you go from all natural to not all natural, it just you know my antennas start to expand and and wonder why it's just just the oddness of it. Granted. People have the right to change their mind, and people and publishers and industries mature. Um, but it's just fun to take a pot shot at MD. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, let's go to you on this one. Uh, well, you know, there's no question. I, ha I you know, I have to agree, again agree with Chris, Joe Weider. I mean, I, I, I wrote for Joe Weider for about, uh, well, let's see, about 12 years. I was a science editor of Muscle and Fitness for 10 years. I also wrote for Flex. I did a little bit for his, uh, what was it, Men's Fitness uh, Magazine. And, uh, you know, Joe really, in my experience, he, he, uh, if you get to know the guy, he really loved bodybuilding. And it's true. He tried to bring on some good people. I mean, his early magazines uh, back in the 50s, he had some of, like, some of the top writers. I, I'm talking about in any field. He had some guys who went on to become some very, very famous writers writing for his magazine. And uh, he was big on science. I remember him telling me that he was going to hire a bunch of PhDs and doctor, doctors, and I said, why? And he said, well, you know, it, it makes the magazine more legitimate, he told me. People want to read that. And then uh, about a month after that happened, I spoke to a copy editor, and she was like pulling her hair out, a copy editor up at the leader office. She told me that, uh, you know, these guys like uh, had a lot of knowledge, these scientists said it, that she was getting articles from. But he says, she says they, they couldn't write it at all. Their articles had to be completely rewritten. They were all in passive voice. They could not relate to the public <laughs> at all. They had no writing ability. So it, it made everybody work a little harder, you know. But anyway, the point is, oh, uh, Joe definitely would be number one. Again, he was, he was the first, you know, and uh, uh, for the reasons Chris and I stated, uh, as, uh, if I would uh, to, uh, to state, uh, I, I'd also give a mention to uh, Perry Rader. Uh, who was the uh, original publisher of Iron Man. He didn't have a lot to work with like Joe. I mean, he operated Iron Man literally out of his farmhouse. He had a farmhouse in Nebraska. He had a printing press set up in a, in a <laughs> barn, believe it or not. I mean, and, uh, you know, Iron Man always had the reputation of, of uh, no BS, you know, pure. They really tried to impart information. Again, he didn't have a lot of money to work with, so, you know, he couldn't spend a lot on writers and that kind of stuff, but but it was very honest and, and good, solid information. Uh, uh, it, it, from the other perspective, uh, if you were talking about the worst uh, publisher, uh, you know, again, I, I'd have to look at it from two points of view. Uh, if you look at the magazine, now the magazine I'm talking about, again, is muscular development. Uh, I would agree with Chris that it, uh, for a while, I mean, uh, you know, it, it was very science-based. They had a lot of good, solid science articles there, uh, you know, and they were accurate. But, you know, from a personal point of view, uh, I'm going to make a flat statement that might kind of shock all of you, but uh, I've met a lot of people in my over 50 years of, of involvement in bodybuilding, and the person with the least integrity I've ever met in my life by far was Steve Blackman. The publisher of of, uh, of muscular, he has this man has zero integrity, because I wrote for him. I wrote for, and we we, we got along great. I mean, uh, I never had any problems with the guy, except that he was a, a total lack of communication. He would never answer emails. He wouldn't respond to phone calls. Uh, but I remember we, we had dinner once in the nineties. Uh, he came to Santa Monica. We met at a Lois Hotel in Santa Monica. Uh, also attending the dinner was Mike Menser, a famous body a couple other people. And after the dinner, Steve walked me out to the lobby, and I'll never forget this. And this, this is why I dislike him, what I'm about to tell you. He put his hand on my shoulder, and he said to me, quote, unquote, Jerry, he says, I'll never screw you around like Joe Weider did. Because I told him that Joe kind of played some games with me. And he says, he says, I'll never screw you around. He says, you'll always have a home at muscular development. That was his exact words. And what he did after that, as, as Chris pointed out, 
he suddenly decided to go all natural for muscular development. And I had a column that I was writing every month called, they called it, This Is Your Brain, I'm on Drugs. It was on basically <laughs> drugs and ergogenic aids. Yeah. And I got a, 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 a note from Angela, who was, uh, who was uh, Steve's assistant. She says, they're changing around the format of the magazine. Steve's dumping the column, but he wants you to send 20 article ideas. So I immediately, right then and there, sent him 20 article ideas, and, and a day and a week went by, a month went by, nothing. I kept trying to contact, no answer, no answer, nothing happened, and I just kind of, you know, after a while I got a little annoyed, and I noticed that in uh, in uh, Steve's magazines, he, he started using like four-letter words and stuff, which I found kind of like weird. He was, you know, in some of his uh, like sex news stuff, and so I, I sent him a short note, I said, hey, Steve. I said, thanks for responding. I mean, I sent you the articles. It's been like four or five months now. You are not. Uh, you don't answer the phone calls. You don't respond. So in the parlance of, of the current editions of muscular development, may I say to you, go fuck yourself, is what I say. You know? Whoa. <laughs> so, you know, pardon my language, but, you know, of course, Whoa. I'm sure he remembers that. But at, over the years, I, I approached him, which was kind of dumb on my part, I admit, I approached him for possible work, and he was always friendly and nice on the phone. He'd say, oh, yeah, Jerry, I'd love to have you back. Send me article ideas. And I sent him the article ideas, and it was always the same deal. Never, no response, no nothing. So, you know, all the guy had to do was say, I'm, I don't want your article. I, I wouldn't have taken it personal. But, you know, the guy plays people. I mean, he has no integrity. I mean, this guy, I just can't stand the guy. This is the one guy I truly dislike in bodybuilding. But as far as the magazine goes... Like I say, years ago, it was a pretty good magazine. I'm not going to deny it. It had some good stuff. When Dave and John Romano were involved, they had some really good stuff in there. I mean, uh, honestly, I mean, to be a, a, a full disclosure, I haven't looked at a copy in muscular development, and it's got to be like five years. So I have no idea how good the magazine is. I, I, did, I did hear from people that it's got a lot of ads in there. And I know that another magazine publisher complained to me once. He said that Blackman was killing the entire industry because what he was charging for ads were, uh, was so uh, under the scale that he was causing the other magazines who couldn't afford to charge that much to basically go under. You know, so he, this guy had a resentment alone for, for uh, Blackman. So that's what I'll say. So definitely the best Joe Weed or the worst Steve Blackman. I have to say, you know, we always talk about iron debate and bringing strong opinions. That 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 was probably the strongest opinion we that's probably the strongest rant that we have had on the show ever so jerry i commend you you brought it dave let's well, get you in on this for uh your best and worst magazine publisher and why i i almost feel like i have to defend steve blackman after that. <laughs> oh my god well you know what the, you know what i'm gonna give you a uh, a real interesting answer my answer is the same <laughs> the best and worst is is steve blackman uh, for, at Muscular Development, I think he, at one point he had the best magazine. And I think if you rate all the best versions of all the best magazines, I think MD back from 2001 to about 2006, no, about 2000, maybe all, all the way up to 2008, was probably the best magazine in the history of bodybuilding magazines because the staff was great. Um, I mean, not just because I was there uh, or John Romano was there, but because it was real. It was real stuff, real science, no bull. We talked about, you know, performance enhancing drugs, diet. The stuff was, you know, cutting edge, the best athletes. And then, I don't know, Blackman lost his mind or something like that. And then that's not because he fired me and John. I, that has nothing to do with it. But he, he went on this vendetta against me. And anything that I espoused, he would find articles that would would, that would would contradict it and he he lost his objectivity and he went, it was, became vengeful almost and the magazine lost its edge because of that because people knew that they were full of crap and that Blackman's agenda was just to kind of try to d d dispute anything that I said and uh, you know it, it basically deteriorated from there I think and obviously at this point I think the magazine is dead because really the magazine industry is dead you can't really rate anyone's magazine there's nothing relevant in there no one's looking at a magazine to find contest coverage anymore so I, I think and I think that Steve you know his aloofness of not uh, you know addressing people when they email them uh, because he doesn't want to hire them anymore or he doesn't want them to work for him he, he, he has that lack of uh, aggression uh, or lack of action it pisses people off you know plus the fact that if you don't pay people on time that pisses them off too so in essence Steve had the best magazine 
and was the best publisher at one point. He was also the worst publisher uh, at many points and maybe currently because of the fact of this lack of uh, aloofness that he has. So, um, you know, I commend him and I spank him at the same time. <laughs> That is going to conclude the debate portion of the show. So we are now going to go to our questions. We go to our producer, uh, Johnny South. Johnny, we have any questions? Um, what does Chris and Jerry think about the Beyond Failure training? Uh, Chris and Jerry, what do you think about the Beyond Failure training? Jerry, we'll start with you. Well, what, I need to define what they mean by Beyond Failure. I'm not exactly sure what that refers to. I mean, is that are they talking about force reps, that kind of stuff? Yes, I, I yes. Well, I mean, it's pretty. It's actually pretty good. I mean, uh, you got to be careful with it because you can easily get overtrained and you can, you know, cause extensive muscle damage if you don't do it right. But uh, I think under certain conditions, it's fantastic for overcoming, uh, let's say, a training plateau, and it's good for stimulating muscle gains. I mean, it's just uh, you have to have uh, balls to do it basically because it's it's really painful. It's really hard, and uh, you know, that's about all I could say about it, really. Chris. Um. I would agree with Jerry. I think um, anything uh, where you go beyond your limits and, and push yourself beyond failure in this case, on paper will stimulate muscle growth. But the fact is you still have a human body and the idea is that you can run yourself into the ground where you can't recover from going beyond uh, failure. It's just like beyond low carb. You know, you can go zero carbs and three hours of cardio infinitesimally. It doesn't mean you're going to be the most ripped person or the most ripped you you can be because your metabolic rate can slow because you're putting such demands on it. So th the same is true with the training. And I can tell you anecdotally, when I learned to train, and I, I think I learned from someone who uh, Dave Palumbo learned from, more or less. We, le we learned through the same avenue. I, I learned a lot of advanced techniques where you, you go beyond failure. And I was so jazzed up on it, you know, that I learned how to push my body, that I did it every workout, and I, I was just, I didn't know, but I was just shrinking by the week. And someone who was making fabulous gains came up to me in the gym in Springfield, Massachusetts and said, Chris, put his hand on my shoulder and he said, if you continue to train this hard, you are going to end up weighing 100 pounds. And I just thought he was like an idiot. You know, I was like 18 and 19 and I was like this asshole, you know, and and I continued with that training until the person who showed me that training came up to look at me once as a bodybuilder, came up to Springfield, Mass and said, what have you been doing? I said, I've been doing the training that you showed me how to do. He said, not every workout. So to echo what, what uh, Jerry said, you have to be careful with it because it can so overly tax your body that you can just you know, grind yourself into the ground and never make any progress. All right, the next one, uh, Chris, this one is specifically for you. Uh, Jay Cutler, did he use a lot of carbs during his diet back in the day? Back in the day when he was just coming up from 19 to, which would have been 1993, to 2003? Uh, the answer is yes. And, you know, someone had sent me a picture from when he first won the Arnold Classic doing a crunch shot. He weighed 273 at the Arnold that year. Um, we can post that picture up. He was just ridiculously hard, full, fibery, dry. And I think it was... I think it's a a combination of the fact that he was young, he trained really smart, hard, and he did do a lot of volume. And his body didn't get run down with a lot of volume. And he created this effect where, you know, there's this rolling effect, momentum effect where where the more carbs he ate and the more not necessarily the more volume he trained, but the, the you know, he with these high volume workouts, it was like he was growing by the week for for you know, three or four straight years. Um, I don't think that would work for the vast majority of pro bodybuilders even, but it worked for him. And uh, and it gave him a, a huge edge in terms of um, over the other guys because, you know, he had the, the wacky fullness that a lot of guys couldn't get. Um, 
So yeah, he ate a lot of carbohydrates early, you know, the early 10 years of training. Jerry, this next question is for you. There has been so much talk about a Lavroni comeback. Now, um, much has been fueled by training videos, pictures, word of mouth, rumors. And, you know, whenever this topic comes up, it's you love the cross-generational comparisons. But now, you know, not only is it will he be back on the stage, but now fans want to know, and this question for you in particular, if he comes in at his best, given the time off, do you think he could beat Phil Heath? Beat who? Beat Phil Heath. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I would have to say no to that. Uh, you know, you have to take into account, uh, it's almost like fighting. I, I worked with a lot of professional boxers in the 90s, uh, Oscar De Loyola, these boxing champions. And, you know, they have an expression called ring rust, where if you haven't fought for a while, you know, no matter how great you are, you know, your first couple of fights, you're going to kind of be like, you're a little bit off. Your, your uh, coordination's not in there. The speed's a little bit down. Maybe the footwork's off. It takes a while to catch up. Uh, it's not the same parallel in bodybuilding, but, I mean, the man, I'm, I'm guessing, I, I think he said he's something like, I don't know whether he's 47 years old or old. I don't know his exact age, but, you know, 50. muscle. Is he 50 years old? Okay. <laughs> Jerry's going to have a heart attack now. <laughs> Is he 50? Cut your carbs, Jerry, so you don't have a heart attack. <laughs> no, no, yeah, is he actually 50? I don't know that. See? 49, 50. Okay, let, let's assume he's 50, right? He's 50 years old. Okay, well, now, now that, that even emphasizes what I'm about to say because, you know, you, you get changes in your muscles as you age, and no matter what you do, I don't care whether you're on the greatest diet, I don't care what drugs you use, it's not the same response. I have a lot of respect for Kevin Lavroni. I, I think he was an fa absolutely fantastic bodybuilder. I do believe at 50, even at 50 years of age, he can get in fantastic shape. But uh, to actually go back in the regular Olympia and challenge a guy like Phil Heath or Kai Green or, or any of those guys or, or Roden or any of those guys, that would be a big mistake on his part, and I think it would be an embarrassment to him. I don't think he could really stand in the lineup like that. I don't know. You guys will have to. Uh, I don't. Is this still a Mr. Uh, Masters Olympia? I don't know if there is or not. <laughs> but if if there is, that would be a good choice for him. If if he could look, if he can get an even, uh, let's say ninety percent. Well, uh, let's say eighty percent of the old uh, Lavroni physique, and he entered a uh, Masters Olympia. I'd say he'd be a, like the old cliche to be a force to be reckoned with, but competing against a guy like uh, these these guys like Heath and some of the or, or my God to stand next to this guy Big Ramy as they call him that would be just tragic to look at it, it would almost bring tears to my eyes. So I hope I, I hope he does not really I think he's just I think he has a, a supplement company and I, I remember Bill Pearl telling me years ago that he competed in his last Mr. Universe which he won in 1971. He competed only because he had just opened the gym in Pasadena, and he wanted to kind of help publicize the gym. That was his sole reason for competing. And I'm, I'm, think, I'm hoping that Kevin is saying this because he wants to kind of like get a little spin on his, maybe his nutrition company or something. He wants to kind of attract attention to himself. I hope he really doesn't follow through unless, again, it's an over 40 or Masters. He's a great bodybuilder. He can get in great shape, but he's not Mr. Olympia material anymore. In my maybe, maybe, he's, uh, maybe he'll really do it this time, Jerry. Maybe he'll, you know, he, how many comebacks has he, has he announced? <laughs> well, you know, because the reason it's I like said other that people are announcing the comebacks years, for Trump him. Says he's going to run, right? Yeah. And now Trump is running for president. <laughs> well, that's a, you got a point there. Maybe, I think he's uh, so maybe I, I, maybe this year, you know, he'll take the the baton from Donald Trump and and decide, you know what, I'm really going to throw my hat into the Olympia. I just hope he doesn't because I like Kevin and I, I'd hate to see it in an embarrassing situation uh, for him. Let's get to the fr yeah. uh, final two questions. This one for the two of you. Got a quick thought on. The best diuretic for the last days before a show. Uh, Jerry, we'll go with you first. Are, are you talking about uh, drug diuretics or? Uh, well, well, the question huh? just has diuretics. So. Andy ones. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's funny. I, I haven't talked about this so long. What's that? What's that most common one, Chris? That, that most of the you know the, the real not spironolactone, the other one. Uh, you know, it's right at the tip of my tongue. I can't remember. <laughs> What, you know, the one that the guys use. Diazide? Yeah, something like diazide, you know. 
uh, you know, that kind of thing is probably, you know, the better ones where you, you know, uh, Lasix is, is pretty good, but, you know, you got to be careful that it's like kind of an overkill effect. Uh, I'd be real careful with the diuretics. They have to be time right. The dosage has to be right. The water coordination and mineral uh, supplement intake has to be correct. Uh, as far as over-the-counter stuff, uh, a couple of guys I know who claim, have claimed success, they sell it in supplement form, this dandelion extract. Believe it or not, uh, I actually came across one study, which is hard to believe. I mean, it was only one study, but they compared uh, dandelion extract to Lasix, and incredibly, it showed a similar diuretic effect. I know, I, know it's, I, I find that hard to believe myself, but that's this one study showed that. So that's an option, too. But... Again, I would use like a, a standard diuretic. One thing to keep in mind is, I don't know if the guys are still doing it, but years ago, they used to use a, uh, a, a diuretic called aldactone, which was based on spironolactone. And uh, what these guys didn't realize is that uh, spironolactone had a cumulative effect. It actually took seven days to actually kick in. And some of these guys would take it like the last day or two before the show. And it really wasn't doing anything when you did it like that. So that's one point I would make if you're going to resort to using that. And, and also another thing to keep in mind with that particular diuretic is do not, do not take supplemental potassium with it. It's a potassium sparing drug. Mike Matarazzo, a pro, he passed away a couple of years ago at the Arnold show one year. He, he didn't know about the potassium sparing effect. He took a bunch of aldactone before the Arnold show and he, and he, he, was t and he piled in some potassium because he didn't want to get muscle cramps. And I remember riding on the bus on the way to the Columbus uh, Veterans uh, Memorial uh, Auditorium. It was just me and Matarazzo on the bus. And I said, Mike, how do you feel? He, and I'll never forget his words, which is kind of, you know, strange now considering what happened to him later. But he said, Jerry, I feel like I'm dying. He said, I feel like I'm going to die on stage. You know, and he, he didn't explain why. I didn't find out till a month later when he told me in the gym about that what he did. He took a bunch of potassium with aldactone. He could have had serious heart problems. I mean, it's just amazing that he didn't. I mean, but he, he, I'll never forget the way he said that. I mean, the guy looked like he wanted, he said, I'd like to get off the bus right now and go back to the hotel. That's what he told me. That's a little true antidote that actually happened. So that's what I'd say. I'd say just a, just a, you know, a little bit of diazide would be good. You know, don't go crazy on the diuretics because, you know, always keep in mind that muscle is 72% water. If you go crazy in the diuretics, you're going to get this flat look. I've seen guys take uh, a lot of Lasix before a show. I saw one guy was like, he was like Dave Palumbo. He was like tremendously vascular about four days before the contest. I mean, he had, it looked like a freeway map, the veins all over him. And somebody told him to take a uh, uh, both oral and injectable uh, 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 Lasix, furosemide. And I remember he showed up. At the show, and I couldn't believe my eyes because I was in the I was in the uh, you know the press panel where I could look at him closely. Man didn't have, have one vein on his body. There was it was like nothing. It was like no, not even in his forearms. It was like it completely gone. No vascularity. I'll never forget that. All right, that's one case, but it just goes to show you what happens if you overdo. Uh, and in a worst case, of course, you could wind up having you know stopping your heart like what they suspect might have happened to Mohammed uh, Benazizi years ago and a couple of other bodybuilders. So, you know, I'd say be, be very careful with the diuretics. Chris, what about you? Um, diazide, hydrochlorothiazide, something mild. You know, I, I, let me let just say this is um, uh, diuretics are extremely dangerous um, and People will hear that and say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but they are, and, and the reason they are is because people have this mythical belief that they can use diuretics and get peeled. And, you know, the only time diuretics really work, in a, I think, in a small amount is when you're already peeled. You know, you, you have to, you, you just... You, they, they're not going to change your body unless you already look like you can win. Um, and what happens ultimately is that people are running into the last week and they uh, really aren't where they probably want to be or should be or could be. And they start asking around the gym and they say, well, I heard so-and-so used, you know, Lasix with L-Dactone with, you know, diazide and this and that and Demidex and Bumex and everything else that ends with X. 
Include next lax. People use that. <laughs> you know, thinking they're going to get tighter. Dave, let's get and, you in on this. Uh, all right, Chris, and, oh. and, and end up like the story Jerry said, where they, not only do they lose their vascularity, but, you know, they have no, no muscle fullness left. And a lot of times what you see on stage and be, be, you're, you're bamboozled by, thinking it's condition, it's condition, but with real muscle fullness. You know, if you take away muscle fullness with, with the same level of condition, you just look terrible. So it, it's, uh, it, it's a question I, I hate to answer for people because, one, they think that I'm lying when I say, you know, I don't like diuretics. And then, two, um, which makes them want to use them even more because they think I'm lying and trying to hide something. And, and they end up overdoing it and ruining their, their, their last week prep. Dave, let's get you in on this. Uh, your best diuretic heading into a show. Well, you know, we've answered this question on Ask Dave, but I'm, I just want to go into it. I want to mention a few things. You know, aldactone or spironolactone, like uh, Jerry mentioned, is an aldosterone inhibitor. Aldosterone is a hormone that causes sodium and water retention. Sounds like a good way to get rid of water. Um, the problem is that, you know, if you inhibit aldosterone and your body can't reabsorb sodium and you deplete too much sodium out, Okay, it's, it's hard to get the sodium back in your body to balance the electrolytes. So that's why I don't like that, uh, that diuretic. Um, and I don't like to dispute anyone on the panel, but, you know, Jerry mentioned that it doesn't work for five days. That's not really true. It actually works immediately. Uh, the problem is after five days, it starts acting as an anti-androgen, believe it or not. And women that have androgenic side effects, they give aldactone to them long periods of time because it has this anti-androgenic effect. Uh, once again, uh, I wouldn't want to use aldactone as a diuretic only because of the fact that it does inhibit the aldosterone hormone. I don't like that mechanism. Uh, you know, the truth is that you really, if you're in shape, you only got to get rid of, you only have to get rid of a very small amount of water and you want to do it over a very short period of time. You don't want to take diuretics for long periods of time because then what happens is you start depleting the water from the muscle and that's what flattens people out. When you take them for short periods of time, what happens is most of the water comes from the subcutaneous or under the skin compartment. The best balanced diuretic out there that doesn't cause potassium loss and only causes sodium loss would be diazide you know, or modiuretic as it's known in Europe. Those are the two that I usually recommend in small amounts. And once again, it, it's so good because it just flushes extra sodium out of the water, out of the body. It doesn't deplete the potassium. If you get a little crampy on, on diazide, you know all you have to do is add some sodium back in, and that will balance your electrolytes. As a matter of fact, a lot of times I use it the day before a competition with my athletes, and then the day of the show I actually feed them sodium to make sure I balance it even before they even start cramping, kind of preemptively. Because when they wake up usually Saturday morning for a Saturday morning competition, for Saturday competition they're dry already. And as long as you're not drinking, you can put the electrolytes back in. So it's, it, it is a science experiment, and like Chris said, Less is better when it comes to diuretics. More always causes problems. That is going to do it for this edition of Iron Debate. Jerry, we want to thank you. We knew this was going to be informative. And not only did you come in and just give, give us really information-rich thoughts, but you brought the passion. They didn't tell me you had that fiery side to you. <laughs> Thanks. But good having you on, Chris. Great having you on, as always. Reminder, tomorrow morning, Muscle in the Morning returns. Dave Palumbo breaks down all the latest in the news of bodybuilding and the fitness world. Next Wednesday, Ask Dave. And then Thursday night, Heavy Muscle TV returns right here on rxmuscle.com. The replay is going to be available right away on rxmuscle.com. Stay tuned in the conversation on the Muscle Central Forum and rxmuscle.com. Special thanks to our producer, Johnny Styles. We will see you next week.